everybody. So today we're going out on this riverboat discovery. First, we're gonna have lunch here because you can also book a lunch. So it was a good deal, 20 bucks a piece to try out some nice stew in the dining hall. I heard they have a cool gift shop inside too. So we'll have to take a little wander around there. And this is one of the things we use that tour saver book for. So it's a BOGO buy one get one so that's a good deal so if you're looking to come you might want to check out that tour saver book yeah this looks excited? pretty neat have you ever been on this i am i have not been on this i so, heard it's a popular thing to do i have driven down here before it, it was a cooler weather colder weather and i don't remember any of this built up area um, it could have been here but i don't recall it it looks kind of new to me yeah, so. they've been working a lot. I've noticed as we drive around town, they're upgrading a lot of things. And again, we're early in the season, so uh, there's not a lot of people here yet. But they do have tour buses that bring people here, because this is one of the major attractions yeah. of Fairbanks. We're here early, so we kind of got the place to ourselves a little bit. <laughs> but the weather's nice, so we just kind of want to... perfect today. To, yeah, there's a boat going down the river. So uh, we'll be going down to Chena River, almost to where it meets up with the Tanana River, and, uh, and then they circle back. And I believe the um, it's a guided tour on the boat, and it's a, a stern wheeler boat. It's a paddle boat. That's cool. Paddle wheel like boat. Like a steamboat? Yeah. So uh, pretty cool. A lot I've of history. I've never been on one of those. Boats. A lot of history here, so I'm looking forward to it. All right. You want to go inside the gift shop? Oh, yes, ma'am. Let's you go. You find something to buy me. Looks like a pretty elaborate gift shop, doesn't it? Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. huge. <laughs> Surely you can find something you need and can't live without. I feel a little bit like a tourist. <laughs> Isn't it funny going back to somewhere you live and you're now a tourist? Yeah. Tourist. Even tourist. though I never came yeah. here. I didn't expect there to be a motorcycle here. That's cool. Pretty nice. Yeah. This is like a hangar or something. I see they have that 40 below experience over there. Oh. Here's your 40 below experience. You want to feel 40 below for real? <laughs> yeah. It's just a big deep freezer. <laughs>
So you're getting ready to experience the 40 below experience. What do you think? It's going to be cold. It's going to be cold. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. You let me know. You'll see how Florida I am. That's right. There's a line. It feels great. <laughs> you think it feels great? Yeah. <laughs> I liked it. All right. Are you ready to move to Fairbanks? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's go get checked in for our tour, shall we? Okay. Look here. I would say all the local tour buses have showed up. I say tourist season is com is officially open now. <laughs> we got checked in and uh, we're ready to go eat some lunch. Part of the 40 below club. You did, yes. Oh yeah, it's gorgeous outside today. It's beautiful, isn't it? The Discovery Dining Hall. I'm getting pretty hungry, aren't you? The smallest one is the one we're getting on. I don't know. Been here before, yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. Cool. Alright, I'll see you guys. All the way down here with me. <laughs> Back here, right here. I'm gonna have you guys, just the two of you. Yep. Yes. I'll have you guys slide all the way down here. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll have you guys slide all the way down here. Ooh, looks yummy. <laughs> Just put your life vest on and walk to shore. You're not even going to get it wet. In fact, if you're over 39 inches tall, we might ask you to get out and push. <laughs> I think we're going to be just fine, though. And by the way, before we get too far away from Little Discovery 1, if you're wondering what it looked like to take this trip in when it was brand new in the 50s, look up on your monitor and we'll roll you some historical footage. When our founding couple, Wade's grandparents, Jim and Mary, we're just starting out and used to do most of this work by themselves with Jim at the helm and Mary doing the narration after they made everybody's coffee and donuts, of course. But even though today's book can hold 900 people compared to 150, 
on the original. The content of the trip is stay very true to the original idea. We're going to share our native cultures with you today. Dog washing in a way I think you're going to remember. Plus, we'll talk about the value of the properties and how many miles south of the Arctic Circle in an area of the state known as the interior. You'll hear us use that word a lot because we're a long way from any of the vast coastline. And in fact, the nickname for Fairbanks is the Golden Heart City. Gold, because that's how we got our start. And then Heart, because we're right in the heart of the state. And it's a special community in my heart because I was born and raised here. I've been in Alaska my whole life, and I have trick-or-treated at 27 below. <laughs> I don't know if you have any idea how long it takes to thaw a Tootsie Roll. Fairbanks, Alaska wouldn't seem like a real good assignment, except that out of his entire company, two guys got assigned to the States and everybody else went to Vietnam. So, very special town to us for many reasons, and I'm delighted we get to share it with you today. Now, you can't do this trip with just a captain and some guy running his mouth. you got to have a skilled crew. And I want to introduce you to the young man who's in charge of that crew, your first mate. This is Josh. Now, he earned his three stripes. Mine are just so I look pretty on TV. And he is a sophomore at Patrick Henry College in Virginia, who thankfully returns to work with us in the summer and has four years' experience on the boat. So, Josh, good to have you on board today. And then, a couple of fifth-generation members of the Binkley family are with us today. Very little water. So they built this pump house with ten great big electric pumps. Could take 6,000 gallons of water a minute out of the Chena and then send it up over top of the hill through the water pipe. Now this doesn't pump water anymore. It pumps very much beer. Especially in the summertime. But it's on the National Register of Historic Places for its role in that mining area. And then all the water they took out of the Cheetah would flow right back down into it through a little Cripple Creek Alaska over here ahead of us into the right. And I know that creek doesn't look like much. They got it on the monitor for you, too. But we point it out because that's the richest gold-bearing stream in the history of the entire state. One, which increased the velocity of the water so then they could shoot it out of these big nozzles and prep the ground for dredging. That one guy in the checkered shirt could do the work of 15 to 20 with picks and shovels all by himself. And then the dredge would walk up like a great big dinosaur and start chewing through all that material, keeping the gold and tossing all the mud and rocks out the back. And it made a mess. We don't do that anymore. Unfortunately, those big rivers and tailings grew back over the Russian trees and I'm told they largely look like the rest of the landscape now. So as more people came up here looking for gold, there have been more stern whalers. There's about 250 of them in Alaska at the height of that era. That changed once airplanes started to become more common. And while I see some of you are getting distracted by that big house over there to the left, that belongs to my ex-wife, and I don't want to talk about it. So how about we look up ahead? trainers and then they found that there was great utility for them getting in and out of tight spaces. This one is going to get pointed upstream and then fire up the 150 horse Lycoming engine. Got to have that special clearance of course because the our airport is just kind of on the other side of the trees there so it's got to keep an eye on the airspace. ice cream in the plane and just drop it out the window with a big red ribbon attached to it. So they could watch it come down and be it. Isn't that adorable? Alpha is headed back now, easing to the surface. When the plane flares, by the way, can't see the water. So that last bit's just done by feel. Perfectly executed on a beautiful interior 
In this final slide, the 1,000 ton Sternwheeler Yukon. Three times our weight. And there's a very special bit of shared history between the Yukon and Discovery 3 that we're going to learn about by visiting with the captain up in the wheelhouse. We can see up there, Captain, what is it these two big boats have in common? Yes, well, we're really lucky to have a piece of history up here in the wheelhouse, JR, because the ship's wheel that Peyton and Harbor are using to steer us down the river is actually the original wheel from the steamer Yukon, that vessel we just saw at the end of the slideshow. So this thing was built in the early 1900s, and it got quite a few decades worth of service aboard the steamer Yukon, all the way up until the early 1940s, when the captain at the time decided to take a little bit of a gamble. It was late in the fall and he thought he could squeeze in one additional freight run before winter set in. However, he miscalculated. And when he got up to the mighty Yukon River, the ice came in sooner than he expected. It froze the boat into the river. And everybody knew at that point that that spelled the end of the steamer Yukon, that it would be destroyed in the coming spring when the ice broke up and went out. So what they did is they sent out a team that winter to disassemble the boat so they could save and salvage all the parts and pieces. And luckily for us, my grandfather led that salvage crew. He came home that winter with this ship's wheel. And then it sat in his workshop for another 40 plus years until he finally found the perfect home for it when we built Discovery 3 in 1987. Yeah, well, this is his first wheelhouse big enough to hold it. And the size of that wheel is kind of interesting. I wouldn't have thought, you know, Harbor might have been able to see over it to learn from his uncle how, how to read rivers. And yet you seem to have somehow solved that problem. What's the magic here? Yeah, well, these two have a little trick. Um, this is actually kind of a family heirloom. Both Harbor and Peyton are standing on our, our Binkley family training box. And this is actually an old Blazo fuel carrying crate, uh, probably 1940s vintage that my grandfather used to have these scattered around his workshop. And this specific one made it to the wheelhouse of discovery number one back in 1955. And uh, my father and his two brothers stood on that very box, kind of getting their first lessons in the wheelhouse, learning how to operate these vessels and read these rivers. And I did the same. And uh, now the, the fifth generation is following in the footsteps again. <laughs> well, no need to change it when it works. You know, and as we see the multiple generations in the wheelhouse, that brings to mind the design of this vessel, which actually blends multiple generations of technology that span practically the age of the country. So how's all that work together? Yeah, um, well, as I mentioned, we were built in 1987 down on Whidbey Island near Seattle, Washington, and we're a modern vessel in every right. Um, but if you look at us and study our design and our shape, we look quite similar to, like you said, the, the steamer Yukon and those vessels of over a century ago that were really partially responsible for opening up the American West into the Pacific Northwest, the Klondike and Alaska. And the key to our design is in the bottom of the boat, the hull, it's very, very flat and wide, allows us to carry the large loads of cargo or passengers in these swift and shallow waters. Today we're drafting three foot six inches, so pretty impressive for a vessel of this size and magnitude. Um, that being said, we've got the modern amenities that you would expect. A good example would be down in our engine room. An older vessel like the steamer Yukon would have burned one horn of firewood per hour to create that steam power, a very labor-intensive process. Same this time of year, anyway. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, it's, it's always fun to see them develop. I mean, when you first started bringing these two out, you could have carried each one in a coffee cup. But now they're, they're kind of, they got their legs under them, they're walking around. Is this time you spend with them significant to their development when they're this young? Well, absolutely. You know, um, with the dogs here, we have something we call the trust of each other.
All right, the Baskins are actually the ancestors of the Apache and the Navajo and came here from other places. The Raven Homeschool Program, first year guide with us and a fourth generation dog musher. Now that's a lot of skill to bring to this. At the Baskin from Fairbanks. Her family's from Northway. And she's a senior at Raven Home School and just joined us this year as a guide, so you get to learn from her as well. Good to see you there, Kylie. And part of what you'll get to learn about today is how human beings were able to survive in this part of the world 10 or 12 or 14,000 years ago with none of the modern conveniences that we enjoy today, but all the same challenges in this climate. With our summer days in the 80s and 90s above, in the winter days you've heard about at 40 or 50 below. Coldest recorded temperature for our region is minus 72. And you probably noticed that our daylight's a little freaky right now, if you're not from here. But in the winter, it's dark on the winter solstice, 21 and 3 quarter hours.